This is Friday, May 12, 2017. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Elliot Goodman. Welcome, Elliot. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? January of 1930. And where were you born? Chelsea Memorial Hospital in Chelsea, Mass. What community do you currently live in? Natick. Your marital status? Married. Do you have children? I do. Three. Any grandchildren? I do. Probably six or seven. And tell us a little bit about Chelsea growing up. It was a very diverse community. Uh, it was a poor community. We all, um, to my knowledge, we got along famously. It was a, a community of immigrants to a great extent, at least the neighborhood that I was in, and an awful lot of uh, nice people lived there. And the immigrants included both sets of grandparents, as I understand it. That's correct. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, my, on my father's side, they came in from um, Warsaw, Poland. Pardon me, Warsaw, Russia. Uh, it was one of those cities where it changed hands on a regular basis. On my mother's side, they came from Bessarabia, now known as Moldova, close to the Ukraine and part of the Russian Empire. And tell us a little bit about your father, whose picture is standing right next to you. Well, first, he didn't get drafted like I did. Okay. He joined. In order to join, he had to lie about his age. So that picture, he was probably between 16 and 17. And um, he was smart. He didn't run away from home until the war was about over. So he only served a few months, most of it down in Alabama. And uh, he kind of jokes about it whenever I talk to him. Can we uh, see that photo? If you can just hold it up for a moment. And he was in the Army for about, about three or four months? Yeah, minimum. Well, he never told me exactly, but I mm -hmm. gather it was a minimum time. Okay. And I know he came from home from Alabama. Uh huh. Uh, he always talked about their peach pies. And I think my mother humored him. Okay, you can put Mr. your dad back down now. And did, did your father say anything else about life in the Army, say like uh, what happened at Armistice Day? No. However, both my father and my mother were very active in the Jewish War Veterans, which was a post in Chelsea, and the American Legion, which was a post in Chelsea. I still have my father's Legion hat, his marching cane, and a couple of medals that he got. Probably the same two that I got when I got out. Now, Elliot, you grew up during the Depression. Tell us what that was like. Well, you know, as a kid, you don't realize that things aren't so good. But were it not for family, I don't think we would have made it. Um, I don't think I ever tasted butter until I was 10 or 11 years old, it was all pure white margarine. And um, we were lucky, we had family around, and frankly, everyone helped everyone else. Mm -hmm. And what did your father do for a living? He started, he went to Wentworth 
college. Uh, he took up engineering and tool making. But he ended up with an artistic bent and he was a wonderful sign painter. He was superb with gold leaf on glass and gold leaf signage. I think he made my first sign when I moved to Natick with black sand behind it, the gold. I wish I had it, but I don't. And um, he ended up working for the Metropolitan District Commission, running their sign shop in Revere, right on the beach, Revere Beach. There's a bathhouse, there was a bathhouse there, and my father and his men occupied the basement, and they made signage for the Metropolitan District Commission, which was used on all of their roads at very modest dollars. At about the time that my father retired, I think he did so primarily because of the fact uh, the state government had stopped them from doing that and had put it on contract so that the low or high bidder, I'm not sure which, mm -hmm. would get the contracts for all of the large signs in the Metropolitan District Commission area. So he was very troubled by that. Mm. So when you were growing up in Chelsea and you were going to school, even at that age, were you aware of events that were happening overseas? That's a hard question, Maureen. Mm -hmm. um, probably. Mm -hmm. I know in my uh, middle years, that is my after 10 talking about now, um, the war in Japan was raging. I can recall a day when Japan surrendered. Mm -hmm. I know prior to that time, uh, the war with Germany and Italy had terminated. So yeah, we had an awareness. Um, we had radio, mm -hmm. no TV, of course. But very later, mm -hmm. a bit later than that, we did have these tiny TV sets about that big and we had glass and lodgers about that big. Let's go back to the time during the Second World War. Do you, were you aware of the bombing at Pearl Harbor? I was. And can you tell us a little more about that? It was a Sunday. Um, I can remember my mother and father being very tense. I was not a kid at that time. Um, I can recall Roosevelt. I think it was on the air, I think it was radio, mm -hmm. but it might have been the first of the TVs. I don't think so, I think it was radio. I can recall Roosevelt's speech. And uh, actually we have been to, uh, my wife and I, have been to Hawaii where we toured the Missouri um, as guests of the uh, Commandant. And it was a pretty solemn place. Great trip though. I'm sure it was. Tell us a little more about life during the, the wartime years, obviously you were too young to get drafted, but do you remember things like blackouts or victory gardens? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was a um, courier. I had a metal white hat with a brim, and it was my job to carry messages from one place to the other. I never did, but I was 
somewhat trained in what to do, which was to run like hell. <laughs> Did your parents do, any, uh, do anything for the war effort? Um, they were very active with the veterans groups. Right. In addition to that, my mother was part of the Red Feather. Red Feather? Operation. You may not recall that because you're too young. But it was an organization that helped people, uh, took care of the needy, but it was, a, it was a charitable thing. And I think that that was all the rage at that time because I know all the neighborhood participated. What else do you remember? Uh, rationing? Yeah. As a matter of fact, my mother and father's ration books were donated. I donated them to the Morse Institute. And they're part of the collection, mm -hmm. together with unused stamps. Oh, that's rare. Right. Um, I was at home at that time, but I was finishing high school. Mm -hmm. And you were, uh, in a, what year did you graduate? 1947. Okay, and that was from Chelsea High School? Yeah. You, you had mentioned earlier, remembering when Japan surrendered. Do you remember when the bomb was dropped? Yes, of course, we didn't understand what, what the bomb really was or why. The only thing that was in everyone's mind was it ended the war. And uh, everyone was terrified of of the concept of having to invade Japan with all of its people who were willing to give their lives for the emperor. So the bombs, the two, two bombs sealed that issue and I think it was a blessing. And Japan has recovered rather nicely from it. Tell us a little more about life in the immediate post-war years. You're still in high school, but things are kind of moving at a rapid pace. You've got the formation of the United Nations, the Berlin Airlift, things like that. Well, I was all excited about the United Nations. I didn't know it would turn out the way it did. Um, we expected that the United Nations would do what the former World Organization never could do, that it could in fact stop war, that all of the main powers would control the wild ones. It didn't turn out like that. It turned out to be that they had a three nations, five nations, that pretty much had veto power over everything. And since they didn't get along, they lost their effectiveness. And right now, it's, I think it's a disgrace. I hope no one arrests me for that. <laughs> You're entitled to your opinions, Elliot. So let's get back to immediate post-war year. Uh, you've, now you've graduated from Chelsea. What happened next? I went to, um, I decided I wanted to go to college. And you have to remember, tuitions were very modest in those days. Um, I had worked at one of my jobs was in a pharmacy. Matter of fact, it was called Sagamore Pharmacy 
in the Prattville section of Chelsea. I could walk it from my house in a little over a half an hour. And I went there every day, sometimes seven days a week. Mm -hmm. I worked behind the counter. I worked stocking. I swept the floor. But I made a little bit of money. I actually had about $300 saved up by the time I graduated high school. I also worked at Fox's Deli in Bellingham Square. And probably four or five other jobs that didn't make much of an impression on me. Um, got into Boston on occasion. Father let me take his Dodge. Dodge? Oh, okay. And when time permitted, both my father and my mother loved to go fishing, and I went along. Not because I wanted to go along, but because they made me go along. <laughs> and that was from, uh, from 10 years old on. And where'd they go fishing? Oh, well, Gloucester a lot up to um, New Hampshire, mm -hmm. down the Cape. Um, rare, it was rare that we took those rides that there wasn't mm -hmm. one problem with the vehicle. Um, but we took, well, they mm -hmm. stuck with it, they took it, mm -hmm. and they dragged me along, I had a great time. <laughs> That's good. Uh, you were just mentioning that you did occasionally go to Boston. Tell us a little bit about Boston in those years. Well, first of all, my mother would take me to Boston. She was a, um, a recorded, what, do you, what is the word you put before file when it comes to shopping? Shopper file? Well, she went to Feline's basement. Uh huh. They went to Raymond's. She went to Raymond's. Didn't want to leave me home in the early years, so she took me. And my two aunts, they also went and they took me. So I was in Boston as a child. I knew it pretty well. Uh, later, I'd go in on my own with the guys, because there were girls out there. And um, I knew the city pretty well. I worked at, um, well, that's a, another story, but, mm -hmm. but I, I'll, when I was late, late in my 17th year, when I was already in college, I moved out of Chelsea and I moved in, in with a buddy of mine in, um, Boston, near Suffolk, near the State House. And then I really got to know Boston. So you just mentioned Suffolk as in Suffolk University? Yeah, well, when I first, I first tried to get into pharmacy school, and the dean brought me into his office and he said words to the effect, I see you have some background in pharmacy. I said, yeah, I used to help out at Sagamore. And he said, and do you have any relatives who own a drugstore? I said, no. And I saw him write something down. He said, I've just prohibited you from coming here because you won't be able to get work. There are too many drugstores. And unless you have a father or an uncle or a brother who's willing to hire you in his drugstore, you're not going to be able to find a place. He said, go out and make your living elsewhere. So I didn't know what to do, but I'd heard about Suffolk University, which was nowhere near what it is today. And. Um, got there and they told me what the tuition was. And when I told them I didn't have any money to speak of, they said, we'll give you a scholarship. 
what was going on is there weren't enough young men around. It was all girls. Not all, but mostly. Because all the men were in the service. So I got into Suffolk University. I spent three years there on pre-law. Three more years in law school. And it was a great place to go to. But it permitted, and they scheduled all my classes so that I could go to work. And they gave me scholarships if I did well, and they, I did. But I held as many as three jobs at a time. Wow. Uh, during the Christmas season, I'd go to work for Jordan Marsh Company in the evening. I was a fellow, I was going to say traveler, but that isn't it. Fellow something. Mm -hmm. um, I also worked when I got out of class, I went down to Hitchcock's Bar and Grill on Devonshire Street and worked there during the lunch hour. And then after the lunch hour, I would travel to South Street, which was the wool and leather district. And I worked for a company called Allied Kid Company. And during the holiday period, I would leave that job and go to work at Jordan Marsh Company at night and thus was able to pay my rent and feed myself and had a great time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, uh, by the end of law school, this now brings us to 1953? Um, I think so, probably. Okay. I took the bar exam. You took the bar exam, passed. Well, you don't know if you pass right away. It takes quite a while. Uh-huh. Ended up in, um, my draft board thought it was wise for me to join the military. <laughs> and that brings us to the start of your Army service. That's right. You got a letter or basically Uncle Sam kind of tapped you on the shoulder? It was show, show up. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And... Um, I was sent to uh, Fort Dix in New Jersey. I think it was January. Cold, raw, sandy. And the amazing thing is about the barracks. The windows in the barracks were nailed in such a way that they were open at the bottom and the top. Now this is New Jersey on the shore, pretty close to the shore. And it was the most uncomfortable place I was ever in. The reason for that is they wanted air to circulate because there were too many people getting sick. And when I got out of that place, I was just as happy as could be. So this is, well, aside from the fishing trip that you were made to go with your parents, was this the first time you were away from the area? No, I had been to... Um, a place called Watervliet, Michigan. I won a uh, public speaking contest and was sent there representing an organization that I belonged to. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're going to ask me now where Watervliet is, I don't know. Oh, how about when did you go? <laughs> Was it during high school, shortly after? During high school. During high school, okay. Let's during. get you back to uh, you getting out of Dix. That was basic, I take it. What was basic? Uh, basic training at Fort Dix? Fort Dix. Okay. Right. And how long were you there? Three months. Okay, so that gets us to about April? Probably. All right. Tell us what happened after that. I was sent to... Uh, Camp Chaffee, Arkansas. 
-hmm. where I was taught fire direction control. and forward observer with the artillery. And I spent another few months there. Uh -huh. And then I was sent to the artillery school, which was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Where they had four battalions many companies. They also had rockets, mm -hmm. the first rockets mm -hmm. that I had ever heard of or seen. They had uh, some artillery type tanks and I went into training there. Elliot, I'm kind of curious though. Here you are with a brand new law degree and here you are at artillery school. Uh, was this your choice or the Army's? Well, they gave me an opportunity to go to officer's training school. But it would have meant an additional year and a half for me. Uh huh. So I thought I'd go through my two years of being in the Army and get out and start my career. Mm -hmm. Hence, you're now in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, learning how to shoot cannons and stuff. Actually, I learned how they set up howitzers, how they aim them, the remarkable science of having shells dropping from height down onto no further forward progress, but just straight down. And how they could be, shoot behind mountains. Um, I learned how to lay out an artillery group, which was generally six howitzers. How they were surveyed. There was a survey line created. And how they would test fire one of those, and then once that one was on target, all the others would set their settings in the same way that the, first, that the one who was firing had, so that they could shoot barrages. And um, pretty effective. Mm. I also learned how to be a forward observer. Okay, and what, what did that entail? With the forward observer? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there were enlisted men and there were officers. And every enlisted group went out with an officer to teach the enlisted men how to become forward observers. Most of the officers hadn't gone to artillery school. At least the ones I ran into. And as a result, our group found itself uh, being fired at pretty closely on two occasions. Um, and I wasn't too happy about that. Hmm. So it was part of the training. Um, and that's where I had a lucky break one day. And I was asked, everyone was asked if they would volunteer who knew how to type. And everyone would nudge everybody else, they're going to have you down at the railroad station on loading typewriters, which is a logical thing. But I decided that would be easier than unloading these big shells that weighed an awful lot. Because I only weighed 140 pounds myself, and I think the shells were over 100 pounds. So I stepped forward. And and they sent me down to group headquarters. I was met by a major. He asked if I could type. I said, well, not very well. He said, don't worry, we'll send you to school. Well, they never did send me to typing school. They gave me a different job. 
and my job was to take over the desk of a sergeant who was retiring, who spent his time sending people to the Army service schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, some of these schools were like Ranger School, Cook's School, Tank School, weren't terribly attractive to most people. So instead of getting volunteers, they just assigned it. And this was not only, this is the only thing I ever saw in the Army that was equal between officers and enlisted men. We assigned both. But generally it was on the basis of choosing. Who would choose? Well, captains would choose some lieutenant that they didn't like. And sergeants would choose some private that they didn't like. And these are the people who got the training to cook to uh, dig, to jump out of airplanes with parachutes, and I did that for a year and a half. Was, uh, what was your, uh, your day like? Was it like a nine to five job? It was exactly that, uh -huh. except it was probably 7.30 to four. Mm -hmm. and, um, it wasn't bad. I got to go fishing. You got to like fishing now. <laughs> well, uh, you know, this is uh, where the Indians made their, one of their stands. Uh, it's where, I forgot his name now, one of the chiefs jumped off a cliff to take his life rather than put up with what was going on. The name of the creek that ran through the camp was Medicine Brook. It was north of uh, Dallas, probably a half a day's ride. It was very warm in the summertime. The wintertime was an amazing thing. Every time it snowed, cars would slide off the road. Um, and probably it's true to this day. <laughs> but I got, got through it, mm -hmm. and I got sent home, or given my leave to leave. Actually, Elliot, uh, let's back up a little bit. If you hadn't gone into this particular assignment, would you have been sent overseas? I would have been in Korea. Right at the tail end of the war? Um, Pretty, that's right, but they were mm -hmm. still sending people over there. Um, it really wasn't a concern to me. I never thought about it. Mm -hmm. But I apparently was treated very nicely as a result of a, a lucky shot. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I frankly have never been to Korea and I don't plan to go. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about life in the Army during that period. Well now, you understand this is a training school. Right. So it's unlike most other Army units where you're being trained for specific tasks. As we were training people for specific tasks. I got to meet an awful lot of people. Uh, at least once a week I visited each battalion. Mm -hmm. And dealt with them regarding their issues of who was going to go to Army Service School. And um, had a Jeep. Had a typist. I also worked in S2, which was the intelligence officer. So I had, a, and I had a security clearance of top secret. 
And that was because of the fact if anything should happen, someone had to open the safe with all of the instructions and the vital things. So it was nice to have a little responsibility and also mm -hmm. nice to be indoors because it got awful hot in the summertime. <laughs> And I really didn't mind the army that much. Mm -hmm. I thought it was pretty stupid in some cases. Um, when I first got, first got to Fort Sill, they issued me new boots. And when I got out of the, through the line, I got to try them on, I found they were too small. So I asked to go back in to change them. No, they wouldn't let me. So I worked with those boots for a week and a half. And ultimately, went to sick call and told them I was there because I needed new boots. And they wrote out a prescription for new boots. And that's how you had to do things like that to survive in that environment. So I wasn't crazy about it, but it wasn't bad. Could have been a lot worse. Yeah, true. Aside from having too tight boots um, and getting shells rather uncomfortably close to you, uh, were you ever injured or in any, in <laughs> any kind of danger? <laughs> yeah, I broke a metatarsal in my left foot. How'd you do that? Stepped in a hole, and it was middle of the summer hot, and they put a cast on me that went from my toes to my hips. During the summer? During the summer. How long did you endure this? Three, two or three months. Ouch. Bet you were happy when that came off. I was not a happy soldier. Uh, yeah, well, at least you had a desk job. But I could go fishing and I could... Mm -hmm. All right, so when did your time in the Army end? I think 53, 54. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, you said you got in at 53, so two years would make it 55? Maybe, yeah, I guess so. Okay. However, I got out in December, mm -hmm. pardon me, January 4th of that year. And where were you discharged? From Fort Sill. Mm -hmm. And I went home with a buddy of mine from East Boston, oh, the West End maybe. His name was Charlie Giordano, and we shared the ride. The car was just loaded. And we got home okay. And I first thing I did was I got myself sworn in as a lawyer. And after, uh, what was your rank when you left? At that time, they had switched to specialists, and I was a specialist third class. Which equates in rank to what? I know someone will correct me out there. Okay. I think it's one step above corporal. Okay. Sergeant. But I don't know that. Mm -hmm. And did you join any service organizations? No. Okay. Did, but I, okay. But I joined the Elks. You joined the Elks, all right. In Natick. In Natick. We'll get to Natick in a minute. Uh, did you uh, use the GI Bill for anything? Yes, I did. I bought a house in Natick six months after I had left the service. And why Natick? The real reason was that um, 
Natick had um, the Campanelli brothers, and they were building small housing. And that's exactly what I bought. I think it cost me $11,500 to buy a house on West Field Drive, which is located off Mill Street. My neighbors told me I overpaid. But that was my first entry. I was working then, I had a job in um, Boston. Just one job, right? Just one job. I still had the Dodge, and I would drive back and forth. The Mass Turnpike was being completed about that time. Mm. But I found a way I could travel more directly through Newton and getting into the city. We had a parking lot up in Bowdoin Square, Scully Square area, where everybody from my office parked at modest prices. <laughs> and what kind of law did you specialize in? Well, when I was hired at this firm, I definitely specialized because they hired me for only one purpose and that was to go to court. <laughs> and I didn't know anything about court because when you go to law school, they don't teach you what to do. They teach you law, the study of law, not the study of procedures. So I had some, met people who were very influential for me and helped me out. Was the clerk of courts, was a man who lived in Newton, and he knew I was a dummy when he first met me. And he kind of when I'd come in with a paper to file, he'd look it over and make corrections and send me back. So he was very important for me because I was doing trial work, minor trial work. And um, I had a uh, gentleman in the office who was a lawyer who I got along with very well, and he was a senior lawyer. He knew his way around. And he bestowed on me the same kind of attention, and so I didn't get into too much trouble. And then when I tried my first case before the Chief Justice of the Boston Municipal Court, after about three or four minutes, he told me to sit down and he would take it over. And I learned right then and there I wasn't very well advanced in the law. However, from that point on, I didn't do anything when I went to court. He, as soon as he saw me come in, he would take it over. And most of the time, I would win. <laughs> and are you still a practicing attorney? Yeah, I'm still licensed. Wow. I pay my dues. Mm -hmm. And Elliot, uh, did you receive any medals or commendations for your service in the Army? Yeah, the same two my father received. Let's see, one was a good conduct medal, and the other was, I think, a victory medal. Really? Same two. My father never made it out of Alabama, and I never got out of Oklahoma. <laughs> Elliot, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, what kind of uh, experience, what kind of value did you get out of your military service? I think the most significant thing was I learned to shut up. Um, you know, when you're that age, you know it all. Mm -hmm. And I noticed an awful lot of people 
were getting into trouble because they opened their mouths. And I knew I had two years to give. And I just decided I was going to give them regardless of whether I liked it or not. And it worked out that way. Mm -hmm. Since then, I've been very vocal. Elliot, is there, are there any other experiences that you remember from your time in the Army? Well, I told you that Fort Sill was a, a place that at one time was o occupied by the American Indians. Yep. And I used to go camping, primarily on weekends, because I had weekends and do it with a couple of other guys. And we'd fish for catfish in Medicine Brook at the same place that Geronimo took his life. So that was pretty memorable. I also got to drive down to uh, Dallas. And remember the fellow who shot, the fellow who shot Kennedy? Yeah, Lee Harvey name Oswald. His name was Ruby. Oh, Jack Ruby, yeah, okay. He owned a nightclub. Well, a bunch of soldiers, where do they go when they take off on a trip? We went to a nightclub, and it was Jack Ruby's, and I didn't realize it until the event occurred, and I saw the picture of the guy, and I realized we had been at his nightclub. Wow. Now that's, you know, a long trip, it's a maybe six hour trip, but Oklahoma was dry. And it was not a, the greatest place in the world where I was. Mm -hmm. So I got out, I worked in Boston. Mm -hmm. I got a better job in Worcester. Yeah. So in the morning, I had the privilege of driving with the back to the sun, my back to the sun. And coming home at night, it was my back to the setting sun. And I worked in Worcester. And then before I was going to get fired, I quit mm -hmm. and opened an office in the Clark's Block, 1960. 1960, downtown Natick. Downtown Natick. Uh-huh. I paid $34 a month for rent and that included utilities, except for phone. Mm -hmm. um, they're just wonderful people. Got to talk to everybody in the world. Mm -hmm. Even the town offices were partially on that floor. I remember that, yeah. And you are also a member of, you're the board, of, uh, excuse me, you're on the board of trustees for this library. I am, for maybe about 30 years, maybe more. And you were also a member of the Natick Historical Commission. About the same period. About the same period. Any other uh, organizations, groups, clubs? Um, I was a town meeting member for a short time. I um, did a lot, I think, for the town that was significant. I helped to rewrite the bylaws and the zoning, part of the zoning code, a very, the portion that dealt with the building inspector. Um, and that's before the state came in with their own rules. So that was a laborious thing, mm -hmm. but we got that done. I was good friends with our town clerk, Eddie Devereaux, and he and I traveled all over the state and mm -hmm. New Hampshire talking. Mm -hmm. Never paying a toll because of the fact he was con concerned about the waste of money. Mm -hmm. Ellie, do you have anything to say to those who are currently serving in the military? Yeah, I think it's a much nicer environment than when I was there. Um, 
I've met a number of the people who are discharged, and they went. They've gone through more technical training, and have been given the opportunity for education that we never had. Um, I know those who went to Vietnam and came back home have been under an awful lot of mental strain and pressure. But most of them recovered. I think there's a better military now than it was. If the politicians weren't involved, that thing would be greater. But there's nothing we can do about that. <laughs> okay. And did, uh, when your children were growing up, did they consider a career in the military? Absolutely not. Hmm. How about your grandchildren? No. Okay. And is there, is there anything else before we wrap things up? Well, I've also got a great-grandchild uh -huh. down in Texas. Yeah. I have a daughter, two daughters, both graduated from Natick High, mm -hmm. one in Texas, one in, in Austin, one in, um, in California, Southern California, and a son, Peter, who graduated from Natick High, who's now in Sudbury. And we see each other on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. they've, lately, they've been flying up here as opposed to my traveling out there. So we're doing well. We have a comfortable house, one level living. Mm -hmm. It's 304 years old, but it's still together. Yes, it is. So I only have one step up from the garage, and I'm home. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marion enjoys herself very much. Mm -hmm. She plays bridge. I was fishing up until a couple of years ago. I'm pretty much done with that now. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, Elliot Goodman, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. Pleasure being with you, Maureen. Okay.